So growing up, the most magical TV commercials that were on in my childhood all had this jingle. I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid. You remember this? And I feel bad for our kids and grandkids today, right? They don't understand the pure joy, the awe and wonder of walking into a Toys R Us or a KB Toys and seeing anything and everything a child could want all there on the shelves. They don't have that experience. I don't know what your kids or grandkids are into, but mine, they're into this thing called Roblox. And all they want from us are, are Robux which is a digital form of currency so they can buy things in the game, and, but they never actually get to play with it. And you can't go back and revisit those things. But I remember growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, Toys R Us used to have a sweepstakes that if you won the sweepstakes, they gave you a, a shopping cart and a time limit. And they let you run through Toys R Us and put whatever you wanted into the buggy. As long as you made it to the finish line, by the end of the time, you got to keep whatever you put in your buggy. You remember this? You remember seeing this? I would daydream about what I would put in the buggy. I had it mapped out in my head, our, our Toys R Us, like what aisles I would go down first and how to, like, to pile that up and get a nice real big haul to go home with. But... Nothing filled me with as much joy as I did walking through that store as a kid. You know, there's something about maintaining a childlike awe and wonder into adulthood. You know, most of the kids have gone out at this point. So let me talk to you adults here for a moment. Where do you find in adulthood the level of joy that you had as a child? Because you need to experience joy in your life. You see, Jesus even calls us to a childlike wonder and innocence when he says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's Matthew 18, three. And so while we are called to maintain our innocence, our wonder and our joy, our faith, however, needs to grow up. It needs to mature. So we are in a series called Together, where we are looking at the, the strategic plan of our church going forward. And as we are talking about this, we're looking at our, the mission of our church, which is connecting people to the grace of Jesus uh, our vision is to be known as a church with authentic love for God and for others, that we envision a community where discipleship thrives, relationships flourish, spiritual growth is nurtured, families are strengthened, neighbors are served, and where grace binds us together. But friends, we can only do that if we grow our community in this thing called discipleship. Now, discipleship is the practice of following Jesus. Now, notice Jesus didn't tell the church. He didn't say, go and make new converts of me. Go make new Christians. He didn't tell the church to do that. The last thing he told the 12 disciples before he left, what he told them, go and make disciples. You see, because disciples carries the implication that there is a maturing of our faith that we grow in our understanding of him and in our practice as Christians. And that understanding that is present in the word disciple is not present in just new believers. So therefore, we as a church are called to help people spiritually grow up. Now, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is written to a Jewish Christian audience in the first century. And while the, the audience apparently is very well versed in scripture, in particularly the Old Testament, they were not very deep in their faith. So the author of Hebrews writes them this, Hebrews chapter five and six, he says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because no, you no longer try to understand. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. 
Anyone who lives on milk, still being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teaching about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Do you pick up that there is an exasperation in the tone of the author of Hebrews to his audience? He's frustrated because they should know better. They should be so much further along in their faith. See, the, his audience has heard the gospel. They've heard about Jesus over and over so much so that they should be turning around and teaching the people coming up behind them. But they're not. They're stuck on the basics. And so there is a severe lack of spiritual development in his audience. Why? Well, it's not for a lack of teaching. It's for the lack of the audience taking their, their own responsibility for their faith. Friends, do you take responsibility for your own walk with Jesus? I worked uh, at my last church with a guy who had done, uh, in particular, the youth ministry for several decades. And I learned a handful of things from him. And one of the things that has stuck with me all, all of this time uh, is that he had a model for ministry that was based on a visual that I really like. He would tell people, envision a big swimming pool. On one end of the swimming pool is the shallow end. And think about a swimming pool. The shallow end's where the kids play, right? They come in, they've got their pool toys. They're all sitting there in the water enjoying themselves. And it's where the adults get in to test out how cold the water is, right? You just stick your toes in the water. You don't really want to get wet, but you're, you're at the pool. That's the shallow end. And then you got like the three to four foot section. That's where the bigger kids go to play and then spend hours playing in the pool with each other. And, and then that's where the adults kind of sink down in and just float, right? They're in the water. They don't really want to do much. They're just chilling, hanging out with friends, talking, right? But then there's the deep end. And that's where those go who want to enjoy the full freedom that the pool has to offer. You got to be all in. You got to be willing to get like go under, right? But that, that's the fullness that the pool has to offer. And I, I, I love this visual because it helps us see the different stages of people getting to be a part of this thing. And so as we begin to strategically plan for our church going forward, of how to grow our community in discipleship. We are going to develop a discipleship pathway that is unique to our church, but is designed to take people from the shallow end, just dipping their toes in the water, to being fully immersed into the depths of the body of Christ. And so we're going to set a tone and a model of ministry that resembles this. But here's the problem that virtually all churches face and apparently was an issue in the first century too, is that too many of us are stuck in the shallow end. We're stuck just, just barely getting our feet wet, not knowing how much we want to commit to this thing. And I don't know, I don't know if it's out of fear. I don't know if it's just not wanting to put in the, the full effort. I don't know what it is, but we want to seek to move people into the deeper waters. Now, Part of the problem I think churches face today is that we enable people to stay in the shallow end. Or to use the biblical analogy that the author of Hebrews uses, we enable people to stay drinking milk instead of moving them to solid food. And part of the problem is that the church, along with everything else in our culture, has become consumeristic. And we set it up this way, unfortunately, that as you attend, you can choose when you want to attend, how often you want to attend, what parts of the ministry you want to engage with. And in the process, and while you're here, we do it all for you. And so what happens is that church enables its people to have very little spiritual accountability for their walk with Jesus. And then 
convenience. Convenience drives spiritual immaturity. For example, it is super convenient for me to have all of the verses that I'm preaching on on the screen so you can follow along. It's really convenient. And every church I've been a part of, it does that, right? But the consequence is every church I've been a part of, very few people bring their Bibles to church anymore. We don't follow along. We don't mark up our Bibles. We don't take notes. We don't uh, try to retain anything that happens on Sunday into Monday, whether it's the memory verse or the the scripture lesson or uh, the music. Like so much of what we do gets isolated to one hour. We don't take the ownership of like trying to carry it with us the rest of the week. But here's the thing. Spiritual maturity takes effort. It takes intentionality. All of you with children in the room or grandkids, you know that the last couple of weeks have been the star tests here in Texas. And it's a lot of stress, right? It's a lot of stress at home to get your kids ready. And it's the time of the year that we realize that just because their kid attended class, it doesn't mean they retained all the information, right? There has to be a willingness to retain this information. And in the church world, there has to be a willingness for those of us who show up to want to grow, to want to change. But too often we show up just coasting in our faith, hoping that we'll grow by osmosis. But that's why I love Confirmation Sunday so much. These students that are sitting on this front row right here, they, they have chosen to wade into the deeper waters. Now, let's be fair, their parents may have made them go do this. And that's okay too. But they've waded into these deeper waters. And you know, sometimes you get thrown into the deep end, right? But in just a few moments, these students are gonna step forward and make a profession of faith as Jesus is Lord in front of all of you. And that is no small thing. Over the last few months, they have learned the main elements of our faith. They've learned about provenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. They've learned about our teachings of baptism and communion. They've learned about the persons of the Trinity and how they interact with each other. They've learned the history of Methodism. They've learned the difference between the Old Covenant and the Old Testament and the New Covenant and the New Testament. And if you don't know any of those things that I just described, friends, I need you to start leaning in. These students have been given the, the deep things of faith. They've moved on to the solid food, to use the biblical analogy. May we, as the rest of us, do the same. But friends, it starts with this book. Unless you are engaging with it throughout the week, you will never grow spiritually. You just won't. It could be, you know, interacting with a daily devotional. And if you're looking for one, uh, there's one that can be emailed to you every morning. It's called the wake up call. Uh, it comes from Seedbed, which is a publisher that our church has used a lot here recently. We, so much so we put a link on the front of our website for you to go and to subscribe to the daily wake up call, which you get in your inbox each morning. It's a great way to start off your day by engaging with scripture. And if you're the type who needs a physical copy of something we have, we have something called the daily bread that's right out here at our welcome desk. We have physical copies if you wanna just grab one on your way out this morning. But then like there's Bible studies. And while here at the church, a lot of our Bible studies are winding down for the spring and going into summer, we've been producing a, a Bible study podcast around the gospel of John. Me and Linda O'Donnell have been doing one each uh, every other week and if they're on YouTube or on Apple uh, podcast or Spotify, we're giving you opportunities to engage with scripture. But then I know, I know you have one of these at home. And do you realize there have been many, many, many people throughout history who have given their lives for this book? To this day, in 2024, there are places around the world that if you get caught with a copy of this, you face jail time. 
And there are still places around the world that people travel long distances to be cramped into uh, packed rooms just to hear this book read aloud. And yet for us, it exists in an app on our phone or sits on a shelf or in a drawer at our house collecting dust. Friends, we've got to grow up. We've got to move from milk to solid food. We, we've got to move past the, the basic biblical stories that we get taught in Sunday school and, and delve into the meat of our faith. But it starts with picking up your Bible and learning what it says. You know, I think one of the, one of the greatest issues in American Christianity today is the fact that Christians don't know what the Bible says. Because if we did actually know what the Bible said, our culture would look a lot different. Statistics show that it only takes 25% of people to make change for the larger group. A minority of people who are passionate and revved up can change culture. We know that statistically. Well, from the 2020 census, we know that 63% of Americans consider themselves Christians. The math doesn't add up. We can be the change we want to see in our culture, but we don't. Why? Because we've not let this book change us. And so what happens is we, the church, need to start moving people from simply believing in Jesus to being disciples of Jesus. And while we can't completely affect change around us, we can affect change of the people who gather with us. And that's part of the direction that we've got to head in to take people who profess faith in Jesus and turn them into disciples who are following Jesus day in and day out. Now, it's fine if you're just dipping a toe in the water and checking this thing out. That's okay. If that's where you're at, that's great. But we want to invite you to come deeper to get a little bit more submerged. Don't stay in the shallow end forever. Start venturing out because I promise you, my friends, the water is fine. 